thanks for joining us here at this event. Um, it's really awesome to see people joining us. And so tonight's event, so it's our Becoming series that we're continuing. And tonight we are featuring Will Gunnell. And he's got a really great story to share. He's excited about his sector and the opportunities that there are in building solid, high quality, energy efficient homes. This Becoming series is all about the energy efficiency sector and all of the dozens, or it might even be hundreds of careers that make energy efficiency happen. At the start of this year, we're focusing on home building. So last month's event was about learning how to become a carpenter. And next month, we're gonna be looking at becoming an architect. And in April, we'll be hosting an HVAC technician. So what we know is that the trades are gonna play a key role in helping us transition to a responsible, low carbon economy. And in these events, we're here to learn how. So I would love to hear why you are here today. So let us know in the chat, you know, what brought you here tonight? What are you hoping to learn? Uh, what made you interested in joining this event? I'd love to hear a bit more about what brought people here on our Tuesday night together. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about some housekeeping. So this event is being recorded um, and how it's gonna work is Will is gonna share his story and then we'll have lots of time at the end for questions. You can put your questions in the chat but if you want to be sure that I don't miss your question, you can use the Q&A tool at the bottom of your screen, or you can raise your hand uh, using one of the Zoom features, and then I can unmute you and you can ask your question yourself. The questions I think are usually the best part of these events, so don't be shy, ask whatever's on your mind. And now it's time for me to be quiet so that we can get to the fun part. Will Gonnell is the principal of Gonnell Homes Inc., a Toronto-based custom home building and renovation company with a passion for exceeding client expectations. Prior to starting a career in the construction industry, Will served as a US Marine Corps with the rank of Sergeant and a New York City police officer. So he's got a pretty unique story and I will let him tell you all about it. So over to you, Will. Welcome, welcome everyone. Uh, it's gonna be a, a little bit challenging on the technology side, so bear with me. While we're doing the Zoom call, I'm also recording on Instagram and on Facebook at the same time. So if I if you see me diverting my attention to one of the other screens, that's essentially what's happening. I don't want to make anyone feel left out. Uh, so if at any point I do turn away, do know that that's what's happening. Uh, thank you all for having me here. I'm gonna shoot. I'm gonna share my screen here for one second, and it's gonna be the way that I'm gonna try to run this on my end is that I'm gonna share a screen and also switch it back so that you can see me so that it doesn't become a stale presentation. And I don't just wanna be here talking so that you see this inanimate person kind of just talking, but I, that's why I wanna do the presentation as well. So here we go. Just gonna share my screen here for one second. Okay. On my end, I just wanna thank uh, Efficiency Canada Thank you for hosting this event. Uh, any opportunity that we get as uh, professionals in any trade or in any profession for that matter to give back to the community is always a good thing. So thank you again for hosting this series uh, on how to become a home builder. For those of you that do not know me, my name is Will Ganell. I'm the principal of Ganell Homes. We are a custom building, um, a custom home builder. And uh, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about my story. I like being vulnerable in a way. I wanna open up quite a lot so that you get to know me as a person and then we'll dive into the meat and potatoes of the presentation. Sorry. Okay. I'm gonna propose a question for everyone out there. This is something that I want you to think about as we're doing the entire presentation. And We'll kind of go back full circle on it and talk a little bit more, a little bit more in the Q and A section. But the question is, what do you want to do when you grow up? What did you want to do when you grew up? For those of you that are a little bit older, like myself, and this is something that I want you to think about for just one second. Sorry, I'm trying to. I don't know what I'm doing here, but I'm trying to. Stop the screen share. Okay. Bear with me, guys. Okay. What do you want to do when you grow up? What do you want to do when you grow up? For many of us, this has changed through the years. Um, I know that, unfortunately, our passions at times do not conform to societies 
or our parental expectations. I say parental expectations because, you know, in certain cultures, uh, on the parental side, you're expected to do things that your parents think is right for you, not necessarily what you think is right and what you know what is right for you. So unfortunately, our passions sometimes don't conform to those expectations. Uh, bear with me for one second. Growing up, there were many things that I wanted to do as I was growing up. Uh, one of them was to be a carpenter, like one of my uncles. Uh, and unfortunately, at the time, when I was young, this is something that it wasn't, it wasn't something respectable at the time. So it's not a, it wasn't a career that you would consider necessarily because it's something that you kind of fell into as a last resort, um, unfortunately. And therefore, I kind of put that away because society and my family unit didn't deem that as worthy. And therefore I went from wanting to be a veterinarian to wanting to be a pilot. And the list went on and on and on as the different things that I, I wanted to be or thought that I wanted to be. And uh, th this leads me to my next point. And you see, I grew up in a bipolar household, a single parent bipolar household. My mom at the time was undiagnosed bipolar. And at the time we knew what we knew, but we didn't know why things were happening. My mom has a third grade education. And as you can imagine, sometimes with that ignorance and that illness that she had for all those many years, there was a lot of um, I had a pretty low bar in life. Uh, anything above the third grade, I, I would have been winning. I would have been winning because the, the bar was pretty low. Physical, verbal, and emotional abuse uh, was very common growing up. And it almost seemed as to ride a passage while we were growing up. I say we, my sister and I. And school became a place for me where we would go to get food. It wasn't necessarily a place of learning. It was a place to get food. Uh, I grew up primarily in the United States where we do get, um, there's a food program in which we get fed. And growing up, I, I watched a lot of TV as a kid. And I remember a lot of the lessons in life I, I took from those TV personalities, the TV families. Uh, shows like um, Family Matters, Full House, uh, Little House on the Prairie. And those of you that know that what I'm talking about, I just totally dated myself by even naming some of those shows. But uh, I needed that. I needed, it was the only way for me at the time to get any type of positive reinforcement. Um, I didn't get it from my, my immediate family. I didn't get it from my mom and therefore I needed to get it from whatever outlet I could and TV became one of those. Now, sorry, I just lost my train of thought. Um, most, most kids, most households, they get positive reinforcement from their parents. And unfortunately I didn't have that. And I, I adapted this, this mentality of trying to prove people wrong. If people said, oh, you came from, uh, a poor neighborhood, you, you're, you're going to be no good when you grow up. And I learned very quickly and very early on to just prove people wrong. You know, like the good old book says, um, cling to what is good and shun what is evil. Th this became a bit of my, my motto where every single positive word that I would hear out there, whether it was directed to me or not, nine times out of 10, it wasn't, you know, whether it was my friend's mom saying something to them, I would, I would use that word for me. And I would apply it into my, into my life in a way that um, I could benefit from it. So life went on and I became the first in my family to graduate high school, big accomplishment. And eventually I joined the, I'm gonna share my screen here again. Eventually I joined the, the New York City Police Department and uh, am I sharing? Yeah, I think I am. I'm not very organized here. I don't know where my slideshow went. I told you guys there were going to be some technical difficulties. 
I totally did not know where my slideshow just went. Okay, here we go. So all right, eventually I joined the New York City Police Department and United States Marine Corps. And it was exactly, it was everything that I needed because it gave me the security that I didn't have. Uh, it was all I had growing up, right? So we were constantly getting evicted from a lot of the places that, that we lived in. And therefore it, it created this, this big insecurity in my sister and I. And although I had passions of being and doing other things, I needed something stable in my life. And, and the military along with the police department were those things. They were the things that I needed at the time. And, you know, to be completely open and honest with you guys, the uncertainty of it all, uh, the uncertainty of not knowing whether or not I had a home when I got back from school was, uh, was it was a lot to bear. And as a teenager, it was very embarrassing on top of being a heavy item where, again, you know, not having somewhere to live is, is very hard. So anyways, eventually we got into public housing, uh, the New York City housing developments. Uh, most people don't see that as anything big, but in our lives, it became something that, um, something great because at, at that point we felt like we won the lotto. It, it was the one place that we thought that we couldn't get evicted from. And therefore it was a great thing. And then eventually through the police force, I ended up moving out and getting my own apartment. And now I want to tell you about that experience. Well, my first apartment was in, in the Bronx, New York. Uh, I don't know if anyone knows the area, it doesn't really matter. And the layout of the building, it had, you need a fire escape by, by code, by building code. This one didn't have one. So to make adjustments for that, what they ended up having was a secondary door. They had a secondary door to the side, exiting to a different part of the hallway in the event of the fire. And I didn't want to see this door because it was a route to my bedroom. And therefore I got a curtain for it at the time. And the curtain was this. So this is Leonardo da Vinci's uh, L'Ombro Vitroviano. This is uh, in a common, in English, I would say the Vitruvian man. And it was interesting because I don't know what attracted me to it. I just knew that it was something that I liked and I, I couldn't quite put my finger on why I liked it. And I wouldn't find out the reason why until years later. And I wanna leave this up here for one second because during the whole time that this thing is in my house, at the time I was a bachelor and it was like the ultimate bachelor pad. And my family and a lot of people around me would say, oh, well, it's gay. Because why, where else would he have a picture of a naked man in his house? I didn't care what they had to say. I liked it. I don't know why, but something about it really, um, really caught my attention. And I, I had this thing. Now, let me just make sure the other slide. And then I, I kind of parked that there. And over time, I ended up finding and meeting my, my now wife, uh, who's a Canadian. And my ongoing joke to that is that there are two things that change a man. And those are God or a woman. And let's just say that I'm not very religious. So my wife did change me. We met and we long distance for about four and a half years. And during that time, things got pretty serious and it came down to who's moving where and what's happening. So I said, you know what? My contract with the military is coming up after eight and a half years. And I was eligible for an early retirement from the police force. I said, you know what? why don't I move up? Because things are a little bit better and easier on my side. And that's exactly what I did. I, I moved to Canada. And when I came here, I knew that I didn't want to go back to being a police officer. And what I ended up doing in the meantime was I actually started volunteering with troubled youth out of the Jane and Finch area, for those of you that know it. And through that time, I was putting kids that weren't great at school the city of Toronto said, if you're not going to go to school, if you're not going to be good at school, we're going to put you in a trade program. And I was putting a lot of these kids, uh, young adults, I should say, through these trade programs. And I said to myself, you know what? 
I've always wanted to do this. And why am I putting them through these programs if I'm not learning it myself? And that's what happened. One day, I just, start, I just got up early in the morning, around six in the morning, and started going job site to job site to see who wanted to teach me. Eventually, a company took me in. And they said, oh, you know, here's some fresh labor. Let's, uh, let's try to utilize it. And then, hold on one second, just got to look for my slideshow oh, again. Because it's not that easy. And uh, so this company takes me in and they start teaching me everything they need to know, that I needed to know to, to start in the industry. Sorry guys, I, my slideshows are moving all over the place. I don't know where my share screen is here. Uh, anyways, you know what? I may just leave it on the slideshow for, for these purposes because I'm getting lost everywhere. It's getting really difficult to switch back and forth between the different ones. Okay, let's just leave it here for now. Okay, so uh, let me just make this bigger. I find if I could find that. Uh, Here we go. Okay. So I started with this construction company and they, they started teaching me everything that I know. I was with them for a while. I became very proficient. I asked a lot of questions. I read, studied a lot. And I watched a lot of videos during that time to become proficient at, at, at my craft. You know, I was very passionate about what I wanted to do and therefore I put a lot of effort into it. And hold on one second, guys. Let me just look for my next slide here. Okay. Now, I told you a little bit of my construction journey and this is me here. I started again with this company, became very quickly their lead hand. Eventually I was hired by a land developer which he, he brought me in and had me doing a lot of his, his construction, uh, which is funny because overnight, essentially, I became my, my boss's boss um, after a while. And I was running some of the sites to which he became a sub, essentially, under my then boss land developer. And this is a great story and all, but now, what does this have to do with becoming a home builder? Like, what is the story of this whole thing? I wanna tell you a little bit about history and why history specifically, because construction out of all things is an ancient human activity. Um, if we take you back, if we think about the stone age, uh, the times of the hunter gatherers, uh, where people move from a wide area and search for food and it was the earth and it was a lot of early temporary shelters. This all began as a need to control their environments and moderate the effects of a wide ranging climates. And early building materials were very sustainable. I, I will say that um, they were perishable, uh, such as leaves, branches, animal hides, essentially whatever they can find. This picture here, for a few years ago, I got a chance to go to, to Africa. This is in Kenya. And I, I was able to meet the Maasai tribe. These are Maasai people. And what you see on the left is, is their, their dwellings, very sustainable. So all that's in there essentially is dirt, cow dung or manure and grass and some minor sticks. So they use the sticks and structures and the cow dung makes it waterproof. Uh, the, the grass and the sticks make it uh, firm enough to erect and you know, you have some portholes on there, the little holes that you see you have for ventilation, for cross ventilation and, and a whole bunch of other things. So this is the idea of our nature, the hunter gatherer mentality. This is how it kind of is sort of started. And then as life sort of progressed, then came the agriculture revolution, uh, which gave a major impetus for construction, why? because people no longer needed to travel in order to search for food uh, or follow their, herd, their herds, but stayed in one place. 
to tend to their fields and dwellings became more permanent. So again, back to the original question, what is a building? I wanna start by differentiating between the two. You hear the term builder get thrown out there. You hear the term general contractor get thrown out there quite a bit. And I just wanna differentiate the two. A general contractor is someone who manages a team of subcontractors to help do various types of construction projects in your home. So in other words, I call a GC as this uh, commonly stated, is they're, they're more like, if you go to an opera, they're like the, the orchestra conductor that kind of puts everything together. And then a home builder is, will usually have a team of people in-house to pull in throughout the project, such as a project manager to greatly streamline the overall process. These two lines, it's very important that we establish this because these two lines get blurred more and more each day, where nowadays with the liabilities and just the proficiency of certain trades, sometimes it's not beneficial to have a particular trade in-house. So the true by its true definition of a home builder gets really blurred with that subcontractor where yes, you know, a home builder will have some people in-house in staff the same way that a general contractor would. And, but for liability reasons or for speed or feasibility, uh, they all essentially use subcontractors. So the, the true in-house build of this doesn't generally happen. So whether you say a GC, a home builder, uh, you're technically all correct in those points. But with that being said, there are three types of builders. If we look at it as this true definition and uh, what we normally see in our day-to-day. -day. One of them is track builders. They're also known as production builders. Uh, they sometimes can be uh, confused and sometimes stated as land developers. And those are the ones, if you ever saw a house that in a, in a certain area that they all sort of look alike, they all have the same look to them, just minor variations. That's what we call subdivisions. And subdivisions are generally built by track builders where they'll build over a hundred, uh, a certain, a high number of houses um, throughout a certain area or in a particular land that might not have been otherwise developed. And the pros to a track builder is, one of the pros to the track is like the price point. They're very affordable. Um, they, they're usually made very quickly, not necessarily the best materials, but the price range and their pricing structure makes them very affordable, especially in this need of the, the, the market, the housing market, you know, we have such a shortage, track builders become essential in those areas. Uh, they're usually move-in ready. Um, once they're done, they're done and you can move right in. And then uh, you can also visit one of their model homes. So you can get a sense of what you're actually getting. Uh, another benefit of a track builder is that they're very established. They've generally been around for a long time. So in terms of warranties and such, uh, it, it, they're usually fairly low risk. Some of the cons with track building is that the, the homes are not customizable. Uh, you get what you get within a few variances of one another, which is why a lot of them look the same. The lots are very small because they usually try to squeeze in a number of houses within the same spot. Uh, they're budget conscious. So the reason why I put this on here is because a lot of times, and it, this goes in line with the next one, which is they only build to building code standards. Uh, building code is the bare minimum you can do to make a good house. It's a good house, but it's the bare minimum you can do. And with being budget conscious, because you have to answer usually to stakeholders and such, a lot of the materials a lot, sometimes are not the best quality. You're gonna get a decent house, but generally speaking, not the best quality. Speculative builders, spec builders for short, as we normally call it. Uh, they're usually people that build or builders that build one house at a time. This is a bit of a gray area at times because there's a lot of great spec builders out there. A lot of times you'll see a homeowner that decides to be a builder and try to build a house um, or an electrician that tries to build a house. Not to say that they can't deliver a spectacular project, but th there's usually a little bit more risk involved with that. Some of the pros with uh, a spec house is that there are generally a lot more options than compared to uh, a track builder. 
uh, they're usually local businesses. You know, they, they generally build in their community or areas that they know. So that's a nice aspect to where they understand the neighborhood and such. Then you're getting something unique. You know, by unique, not quite custom, but just unique. Some of the cons is that they can be less customizable if they're already in progress. Uh, you kind of get what you get and you can get upset, as I tell my daughter. And uh, because they're small businesses, sometimes they can go uh, out of commission. So in terms of uh, worrying about warranties on the line, uh, it, it, is, it can be sometimes a bit of a worry. And the next one is a custom builder. And like the word says custom, sky's the limit. Or I should say, uh, sky is dependent on your budget. You can get anything you want as long as your budget allows, essentially. Uh, some of the pros with that is that it's extremely customizable to the last very detail. You can put whatever, however you want in them. Build in your own lot, uh, depending on the size. It could be very big, very small. Uh, it all depends on your size of the lot that you purchase. Um, and because builders, custom builders only build so many houses a year, uh, you essentially have a very personal relationship with them, which is sometimes can be very important being that this is such a sizable uh, expense in life and, and monetarily wise. So that can be a very good thing. Some of the cons is that there can be a very long wait um, for a custom builder because like I said, they only build certain houses, so many houses at a time. So waiting on them can take a little bit longer. And harder to visualize. Now we have the aid of 3D renderings and such, but there is no show home, unlike a track builder where there is one home that it becomes a show house in order for you to see more or less what you're gonna get in terms of finishes. So what kind of builder am I? I'm actually a custom builder. And when I started, I was greatly benefited from working with an ICF builder. ICF stands for insulated concrete forms. It is a very energy efficient way, very durable, as you can imagine, like the name says, it is made out of concrete. So you're getting a very durable structure. And funny enough, when I started in construction, because I started with this, I had to work backwards where I learned how to work with ICFs. And then I had to learn how to do balloon framing. And you know, it, it never made sense to me because again, at the time I was working with this builder that was very, building nothing but high-end homes and usually very conscious of the energy efficiency side and sustainability of things. And I learned all this, all these sustainable practices and, and ways of building that conventional framing just never ever made sense to me. And therefore, once I started there, it was very easy to sort of keep going and and keep tracing those steps. And then here we just have various things. So the picture on the lower left is a, it's just a party wall for an elevator shaft. And the white partition I see on the, on the lower left there, that's actually an ICF pool. That's, a, that's the forms going up for an ICF pool. And the, the top right photo, that's actually exposed, an exposed ICF wall where you have concrete on one side and on the other side you have the foam for your um, for your insulation and such. So it's a bit of an architectural, you can do quite, you can do quite a number of things with, with an ICF uh, foundation. So what does an ICF home look like? It can look like any other home. Once it's done, you'll never tuck. The lower left photo, as you can see there, that is absolutely 100% ICF down from the foundation all the way to the roof. And as you can see, it's in a more traditional setting. Uh, same thing like the top, top right. And then the lower, the lower right, you see more um, uh, a modern or contemporary look as they call it. That is all ICF. So ICF can look like anything that you want it to. And again, because it's a custom build, sky is the limit or sky is as high as your budget goes. So ICFs, they call it the Lego of construction. Why? Because they have nubbies, what I call nubbies, uh, and which they interlock with each other. The same exact uh, methodology that you have in Legos. They just kind of snap together and it's very easy. The forms stay in place and they add to your thermal resistance of your building, making it very efficient. Now, within this Lego photo, you will also see an old Lego figure. This is called Vitruvius. 
And if you remember my earlier statement uh, of that, that curtain that I had, this is where everything starts to come full circle. Vitruvius was this grand, I don't know his exact title, but he's this grand architect of the world in the Lego movie. I have three daughters, so I know all about Legos. And uh, he's this grand old architect of the Lego world. And he teaches Emmett, who's his main character, how to be a master builder. And so he's like a demigod or a god type figure in the Lego movie. But it's interesting that they call him Vitruvius because Vitruvius comes from Vitruvian, who's a great Roman architect. And once I started learning a little bit more about this, this is when everything started coming full circle. This is Vitruvius here. So who is he? Who is Vitruvius? Marcus Vitruvius Polo, Polio, and we actually call him Vitruvius, but he was a Roman author. And he was a Roman author, an architect, a military engineer, and an artillery man within the engineering uh, department of the Romans. And again, I, I quickly became attracted to him because his resume. Again, he was an architect, he was an engineer and a military person. As a military person, I was able to connect with him pretty much instantly and it, it took no time. And the more I learned about Vitruvian or Vitruvius, I, I quickly learned the connection between him and Leonardo da Vinci. So Leonardo da Vinci, uh, by the way, I must say, I don't know if you can see this or not, you probably can't, but this book is called uh, The 10 Books of Architecture. These are his writings. These are uh, Vitruvius's writings. It's a collection of 10 books put together, really amazing. And essentially all it is, is about the proportions of the human body. And he teamed up with Leonardo da Vinci and the Vitruvian man, who's the man in the curtain that I had in my first apartment was, Leonardo was not the first, uh, he was actually one of the last ones to kind of touch it. But that whole thing, that whole thing is very fascinating because that's science, mathematics. This is science, mathematics, and art put together. It's like one of the first times that they actually all married into each other. And the more that I started learning about it, the more fascinated that I got and the more that I understood my passion and why I was attracted to it. So this is the proportion of the human body. And he says, if you divide your body in half from the navel cavity up and from the navel to your extremities of your arms and legs, the human body is equally proportionate in all areas. And although it may be easy to only see two figures in this, in this uh, uh, sketch of his book at the time, the actual uh, person uh, actually has 16 different positions. He's actually situated in 16 different positions. And what does that mean? This translates now into our buildings, the way that we do things. If you see the, the woman on the right, this was something that was adopted by the Romans when it came time to proportions. That's, that's a, the, the profile photo of a, of a column to show how everything comes in line in proportion to the human body. And that's how architecture and home building should really be, which is a harmonious marriage of proportions in a home. And this is the David, because I was so fascinated by Leonardo's work. Again, Leonardo himself was also very uh, fascinating. Everyone knows him as a, uh, an artist. Uh, he was an inventor, an architect, an engineer, mathematician, and an amateur, um, I can't remember the name, anatomist of the human body. So he was a very fascinating uh, individual. And I got the chance to go to Italy and I had to see this. And the reason why I post this photo is, it's hard to imagine, we see the statue all over in postcards and wherever else you, you might've seen it, but the statue is massive. I, I, I'm literally just at the pedestal and my, my face, my, my head barely clears that. So again, a very fascinating, very, very big structure. Um, and it shows like the proportions, the nails, the every single part of the human body in very, very nice and interesting details. Now, Vitruvian was a very old architect, but he was not the first. It just so happens that uh, his work, his writings uh, survived for such a long time. That's why we know so much of him. But he was also um, uh, influenced heavily by Greek architecture. Now, Getting to this point, what do you see here? This is actually my daughter 
doing some work on for her school. He's just doing a project. And I, I want to say I'm going to wear this one, but I want to say she takes after her dad in that she's hopefully one day getting into, into construction. And, uh, you know, to me, that, that just warms my heart. There aren't enough females in this industry. And I think that female builders uh, just make amazing builders. And, and they're part of the reason why I shared my story is because there's a little bit of, um, uh, it's funny how you think, here's this kid that barely had a house growing up, was getting kicked out of every house that he lived in, essentially building homes for other people. And that's just to show you that you can master your own destiny. Uh, sky is the limit when you set your mind to it. And when you follow your passion, never follow the money, but follow the passion, whatever your passion may be. And if so, your passion is to become a home builder, wherever, whatever situation you may be. Uh, I just want to encourage that, uh, especially with the, with the females, um, because the construction industry as a whole is very male dominated. And one of the biggest takeaways with that, I just want to give you some takeaways. And the takeaways are, let me just stop the screen share. Hopefully I can find where my things are here. But one of the biggest takeaways are by human nature, by human nature, we're all builders. Our, our, our deepest instinct is that we're builders from our, you know, our early ancestry of, again, the, the hunter-gatherer mentality. We were builders. Um, you know, we build businesses, we build things. We're builders by nature. Uh, we just happen to be builders of dwellings. It's the only thing. And one of the biggest takeaways in terms of encouraging uh, the future generation is start early. Uh, some studies have shown that starting the conversations and let's say like a workshop in high school is already too late. It's already too late, let's say for the females, it's already too late even for some of the males because they've actually realized that getting them early on in life is actually the key to keeping things going and keeping the generation going. So those are the biggest takeaways. Is see, and the other thing is see continual learning. Continual learning is really the key to any success as a builder. So here in Ontario, this is in Canada, for those that may be watching far away. Well, how do you become a builder? They say that it takes about 10,000 hours for you to master anything. I say even more than that. 10,000 hour equates to a minimum of five years. I say you need a little bit more than that. Unfortunately, in the, city, in a, in the province of Ontario, in the city of Toronto, that is not regulated to a certain extent. There is no license that tells you you are a builder, but there's a Tarian warranty. You being a Tarian certified builder, which is something that you need to have by law in order for you to build a new home, and a lot of people just don't know, uh, that is how it's regulated. And for those of you out there, they have like a 98 conviction rating on their uh, prosecutions. So it, it's something that you may want to look into as a homeowner, something that you want to look for, if that's something that um, will give you a peace of mind and just want to throw that out there. So with that being said, I want to open it up for some questions and take it away, Kirsten. Awesome. Thank you for sharing. I think that uh, when we hear stories like yours for, you know, you face challenges, you follow this really winding path and still ended up somewhere that you're really excited about where you're doing this great work. I think that it's really helpful to hear, um, hear stories like that. So thank you for sharing. I want to start with a question we have here from Andy saying, hi, Will, what a great story. Thank you for sharing. What would you say is your strength in staying positive and passionate for what you do? So how do you how do you stay positive? How do you stay excited? So for those of you out there, the question was asked, how do I stay positive about the things that I'm doing? It's very easy. I love what I do. And you know, and even in life, it's funny because even in life, if you guys ever seen uh what's it called? Sandra Bullock made a name, I made a movie, that football movie. Um can't remember, it'll come back to me. But the, the this is a kid that came from an, an, an unusual background and circumstance. And he said that his biggest strength was the ability to forget. You know, and I think that that was the greatest gift that he had. And that was my greatest gift. I forgot to the extent that I wouldn't let it weigh me down, but I forgot to the extent that I can move on. And I think that that's, that's key in anything in life, really, 
It's just learning how to move on because I wouldn't dwell on the negative. I would just focus on where I'm going. And when you're so passionate about something, whatever it is in life, you just focus on that path and you don't generally look back. Awesome, thank you. And so we do have some questions that were submitted ahead of time, but if anyone else has questions, feel free to use the Q&A tool there. So we have another question here. Hey, Will, what would you advise to a construction student who loves the field, but feels like they would be useless to the field because of their lack of experience? So the question was, was asked, how, what do you say to a student or anyone young that's starting in the industry, but feels like there's not a lot that they can offer because of lack of experience? And I say that you're underselling yourself. And the reason why I went into my story is because I'm a great builder because of my story. The industry teaches you the bare minimum. It teaches you what you need to know, but it's that personal touch, that personal experience, those personal touches that only you can offer. I'll give you an example. One of my, one of my friends, she's a, she's a mom. She looks at building completely different than I do. She looks at, okay, if I'm holding a baby, how far do I have to walk to the fridge to cook and do this? And they just look at it completely different. Like, how do I organize this? Okay, what about the laundry to the room? And I, I think that one of the things that I, I, I say is use your background. Use their, their all strength. doesn't matter where you come from in life. Everything you've done up to this point is your strength. Yeah, that's such a great example. Like just our own experiences can bring so much to any job. So that's that's a great example. Um, and then I think we have time for one more question here. We usually wrap up around 545. So this is one that was submitted ahead of time. It's a bit more on the, the technical side of the job, but do you find it's difficult to sell these higher quality and, and more energy efficient homes to clients? Or do you find that they, they tend to understand you know, what it is that you do and why your work is different? I do a lot of education. So the question was asked, is it difficult to sell some of these um, higher finishes or quality, sorry, I just wanna make sure I get that right, or quality or um, sustainable? Sorry, I just wanna make sure I understood the question right. It's not always difficult because it all comes with education. Um, when, let's say, building a new home, the homeowner has generally done a lot of homework and he or she are usually smart individuals. Uh, because the price tag for a new home is usually very high, which means that they must have done well in, in their careers to be able to afford it. So therefore, they're, they're rational individuals that will understand if you tell them, listen, I need to do this because if I don't, I won't be able to serve a warranty on an inferior product. Or you should do this to consider the effects on this, that, and the other. And by you educating the client, it becomes, generally speaking, fairly easy. And the reality is, at the end of the day, if they don't conform to certain things that will be very uh, questionable in terms of uh, quality, then you know what? They may not be the right client for you. And saying no is okay, too. Yeah, that's great advice. And I'm going to make an exception and go a little bit over time because there's a really great question that came in, and I think you'll have a really great answer. So. Someone has asked, as a home builder and a leader in the construction industry, he's wondering what kind of steps you might consider taking to engage underrepresented groups in the industry, such as women, Indigenous Canadians, and new Canadians. So as a, as a builder in the industry, how do I consider, how do I take part in uh, helping and, uh, sorry, I'm trying to replay the question again, and serving those in underprivileged communities. I actually, a couple of things there. So I'm actually a program advisor with uh, George Brown College uh, to shape our future, first of all, uh, from a school level. On an individual level, uh, there's a ton of mentoring that I do on and off professional levels, so one-on-ones. And I, I purposely look, I have three daughters. So when it comes to, and I'm a minority, I've been through it, I've been through it all. So I know how difficult it can be for some of us coming from some of our backgrounds, and especially the indigenous community. And I, I purposely go out of my way to encourage and seek those individuals out to give them as much motivation and as much help as I can so that they can step out of their situation and break that glass ceiling in a way for a lot of them. That's awesome. Okay, so we're over 545. 
I'm going to close things down, but I want to say a huge thank you for coming, for answering everyone's questions, for sharing your story. It's really cool to hear how you've gotten to where you are. Um, and I want to let everyone know the series will be continuing. So if you want to tune in next month, we'll be learning about how to become an architect. And if you have any other questions for Will, I'm sure he would love to hear from you. So uh, if you want to put your email in the chat or if there's any other ways, I know Evie has shared your Instagram as well. So definitely reach out, connect any way that you can. And this event will be recorded. So if you missed anything, tune in online. You can definitely uh, go back and check everything out. But thank you, Will. Thank you, everyone, for coming. And My have pleasure. an awesome My pleasure. day. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. And thank you guys for hosting. Really appreciate it.